Israel's Negev Desert, a land of searing heat, dry, barren, and yet ruggedly beautiful. A place where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob walked, where Moses and the children of Israel wandered, and allotted to the tribes of Judah and Shimon. Today it makes up 60% of the modern state of Israel, and it is still a land of wonders. My name is Professor Simon Barak from Ben Gurion University, and I'm standing here in Midrashid Ben Gurion, overlooking the spectacular wilderness of Zin. And I'm standing right by the graves of Israel's first Prime Minister, David Ben Gurion, and his wife Paula. And this is really fitting because it was Ben Gurion's vision to settle and develop the Negev and make the desert bloom. And Ben Gurion is often quoted as saying that it is in the Negev that the creativity and pioneering spirit of Israel will be tested. I grew up on the stories of the early Zionist pioneers who came to the land of Israel to set up a Jewish homeland, establish the kibbutzim and the moshavim, and set out to cultivate the desolate land and grow crops in places such as the Negev where nobody thought they could be grown. Nowadays we hear a lot about Israel's new pioneers in high tech, in cyber security, in computer software, but what about agriculture? And what about agriculture in the Negev? Can we find that spirit of innovation that David Ben-Gurion envisioned? And what about the stories behind today's desert pioneers? One of Ben-Gurion's dreams was to set up an Oxford University of the Negev, which would attract Israeli scientists to carry out the research to promote sustainable development of the Negev and dry lands all over the world. So what better place to begin our journey than Ben-Gurion University's Jacob Blaustein Institutes for Desert Research on the Stebokair campus. We're going to meet later on some of the amazing scientists who are pushing forward the frontiers of desert agriculture. But right now, let's go and meet our first desert farmer. So Rami, you've been a jojoba farmer for many years. What actually is this jojoba plant that we can see? Well, it, uh, it's a plant that came from uh, the United States, or southern United States, Mexico, and it was cultivated in Israel about 30 years ago. The dunam is 1,000 dunams. It's uh, approximately 100 wow. acres. That's, that's a large field then, it's, yeah? Yes, it's a medium size. In Israel scale, it's a medium it's a medium size, size field. Yes, yes. And um, what does the jojoba plant produce? The plant produces seeds, and from this, those seeds, we produce oil. And what do actually is the oil used for? What is the main market? Mostly for the cosmetics uh, so it's, mo it's mostly for the cosmetics market. That's right. So yes. Why is it so good for cosmetics? It replaces uh, whale oil. Oh, well, that's a good reason. Yes, it's kind of a green oil. And uh, it's the closest oil to our nature body oil. So this is the advantage of this oil. I understand from what you've told me in the past that Israel is a real major player in this uh, market. What is the size or what is Israel's proportion of the market? In the two years from now, when the plantation like that will produce uh, seeds, uh, we're going to be approximately 50% of the market. Worldwide? Worldwide. That's huge. 
Yes, it is. So I'm still trying to understand why Israel has captured so much of the market. Is it just that other places are not growing it? They don't know how to grow it? They're not growing it as well? Well, the reason is that we uh, change the technique of, of growing the jojoba and the research, of course. Everything is combined with the farmers. So this is the reason that we got so, so good. good, yes. Well, jojoba became a very popular crop in Israel uh, recently and very popular in the desert areas. We, lucky enough, we have a cell and water as brackish water in the uh, groundwater that we can pump and use for irrigation. Jojoba plants are very, very tolerant to salinity and we're trying to check different levels of salinity and how it affects the growth of the plant and different parameters like photosynthesis, root development, shoot development, and at the end, the yield of the plant. So far, we didn't find any significant effect between the different salinity level, which is good for farmers, because then we can irrigate the plant with less expensive water, with high salinity, and we hope to get the same yield as with low salinity. This is a very large initiative that involved many institutes uh, around Israel. Uh, we have the Ben Gurion University, uh, R&D, Research and Development Facility in Ramat Negev, which hosts this experiment. And we, by using the cell and water that's available here in the desert areas, we can grow this plant and encourage farmers to grow this plant and make money out of the oil that they produce from this crop. So Rami, I see that the plants here uh, are quite small. Um, how old are the plants here? The, the plants here are about nine, nine uh, months uh, old, and they're going to be as high as three meters. Wow. Yes. You, you want to see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to see it. So come on. Okay. Let's go. Oh, hey, 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 a brand so Simon, you, as you can see over there, there's a plantation that's about two and a half years old. And where we're standing now is a 30, almost 30 wow. years old plantation. So this as is you can huge. see the height. Yeah. This is huge. So Rami, uh, from our past conversations, I know that you were actually born a city boy. So yes, I, I was born in Ramat Gan. Oh, a real city boy. Yes, and uh, my family, I haven't actually has, uh, had any family because everybody uh, were uh, killed in the Holocaust. So uh, there's a family in Moshav that uh, actually almost adopt me. And this is, was my first introduction to agriculture. And from then, I wanted to study agriculture, so I went to high school in Pardes Khanna, the agriculture school. And from then to the army, I was at the power troopers and uh, came to Zdeboker and started uh, agriculture. There. And you've, what, what is it you love about agriculture? Well, it's the most exciting uh, occupation I think there is. It's not actually an occupation, it's a way of living. And here in the desert, especially in the desert, to make the desert bloom, this is how you do it. Our next stop is a Moshav, just a few meters from the Egyptian border, that is named after a site or sites in southern Canaan and the kingdom of Judah. And Moses sent messages from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the hardships that have befallen us, how the Egyptians oppressed us. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and brought us out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. The modern Kadesh Barnea is home to over 40 families. And we are going to meet a special young family who has decided to settle here and grow exotic mushrooms. I grew up in uh, Kirat Ekron, which is near uh, Rehovot, in the center of uh, Israel. I grew up in the Kirat Ekron, So what actually inspired you to become a farmer and to become a farmer in the Negev? One of the things that have been affected by me is the fact that my father and my father, both my father and my father, came from Argentina. היה להם את הוויז'ן של לעזוב את החיים הנוחים בארגנטינה ולעבור לארץ. 
הם באו לארץ במטרה לעשות חקלאות, הם באו לארץ במטרה להתיישב. סבא וסבתא שלי עלו בשנת 52 לארץ. הארץ הייתה בת חמש, לא היה פה יותר מדי. את, ה... את החקלאות שהם רצו לעשות פה, הם כבר התחילו ללמוד בארגנטינה בכל מיני תנועות נוער, שלימדו אותם את עבודת האדמה עוד בארגנטינה, שככה שהם נוחתים בארץ הם כבר יודעים לעבוד, לא לבזבז זמן. זה סיפור שאני, כל החיים בעצם, היה לי אותו בראש, וכל החיים, ההרגשה הזאת של כמה המדינה חשובה, וכמה הציונות, או כמה לפתח את הארץ זה יותר חשוב מהמשפחה, מהמקום הנוח, זה תמיד היה, וזה גם חלק מהדברים ש... שהביאו אותנו לפה. כל החיים שלי אני גדלתי במושב שיתופי. מושב שיתופי זה כמו קיבוץ. כל החיים עבדתי בחקלאות, כל החיים ידעתי ש... שאני אוהב את זה. מה שהוביל אותי לפה בעצם, לנגב, להיות uh, בעל עסק משלי, זה ה... המחשבה שאני רוצה להיות עצמאי. זאת אומרת, לא רציתי להיות שכיר בעבודה בחקלאות, בקיבוץ, רציתי שיהיה לי עסק משלי, שאני אוכל להחליט עליו את מה שאני רוצה לעשות, ובעצם uh, זה אחד הדברים שהוביל אותי. So, Hila, how did you get this idea of growing exotic mushrooms? We met this guy that told us about the exotic mushrooms and he told us that there isn't any exotic mushrooms that are not being imported from Europe or from the East and we thought that it can be a new agriculture to do in this area. In addition to that, we flew to the Netherlands in order to see a little bit about the field and to learn more about it and we met a guy in the Netherlands After we met him, we understood that he is one of the leading people in, in Europe in the exotic mushroom field, and he told us everything about it. And uh, we were very excited to hear about it, and we said, okay, so we're going back to Israel, and we're going to build our farm and grow exotic mushrooms, and we're going to be the first one to grow mushrooms in the Negev uh, ever, kind of uh, pioneers. Uh, so we decided that this is what we wanted to do, and we came back to Israel, and uh, Tupaz built everything by himself. We are marketing our mushrooms. We have a couple of days that we are uh, driving to the center in order to sell our mushrooms. But we are uh, in contact with uh, some of the big uh, supermarkets in Israel, uh, the ones that are more organic or more uh, healthy supermarkets that buy from us. So these are organic mushrooms? Yeah, yeah, they are. Oh, okay. um, we're so happy to live here. The kids are living uh, in the nature. I think this is the main purpose why we came here. Beside the fact that we want to be farmers. We have decided to build our house in the desert here in Kadesh Barnea. So in a couple of months we're supposed to move in. And this, these are our roots in, in the desert, in Kadesh Barnea, in Ramat HaNegev. Uh, we feel connected to this, to this place. So we're now deep in the southern Negev region and we are on our way towards Mitzperamon and we're going to visit an agricultural industry which has really flourished in recent years all over this part of the Negev and it's where Ben Gurion University researchers have had a real impact and I have to say I'm really looking forward to this one and you'll see why later. So here I am in the absolute middle of nowhere. And what can we find here? Vineyards in the desert. So we're about to meet my close friend and colleague, Professor Aaron Fite from the Jacob Blaustein Institutes for Desert Research. Aaron made Aliar in 1992 from Italy and he's a plant biochemist and the leading scientist in the agrotechnology and biotechnology of desert uh, viticulture. So viticulture is the production of wine grapes. So let's go ahead and meet him. Hey. Hello, Simon. So it's amazing to be in a vineyard in the middle of the desert, Aaron. Why grow grapes uh, in the desert? Well, the desert has been used for uh, uh, wine production thousands of years. And here the, the, the good uh, things about desert viticulture are the fact that uh, we have nice solar radiations. Moreover, 
we don't have a large amount of humidity, which helps plants not to be attacked by pathogens like fungi. And you can control very precisely the amount of irrigation each plant or each cultivar gets, including also the amount of fertilizers the plant gets. So this is drip irrigation? Drip irrigation, which is an Israeli technology, which Netafim uh, is uh, uh, distributing throughout the world. Do most of the farmers here grow grapes for the major wineries in the centre and north of the countries or do they actually have their own wineries? Yeah, I would say it's both. Um, you have both uh, small uh, wineries and farmers that try to make a living out of ecotourism uh, with a small production like 2,000 bottles uh, a year. And you have then the big wineries from the centre and the north that are actually growing their grapes here because they want the characteristics, uh, characteristic aroma and fragrance of, uh, of the desert. Of the desert wines. Are there any Israeli varieties, like Israeli native varieties that are grown in Israel for wine? So uh, viticulture in the past stopped when the Ottoman Empire arrived to the region. So it was quite a long time ago. And since then, there was no real wine production in Israel until modern times. So there are Israeli vines found in the wild and now they were collected by Dr. Elio Shivdrori from uh, Ariel University in a nice collection mainly uh, for uh, uh, breeding purposes. Mm -hmm. So Aaron we're going to be seeing you later so for now we're going to say bye and we have with us um, one of your students Noam Reshef, who's just at the end of his PhD and we're going to talk to him now about some of his uh, work um, that he's doing in this actual vineyard. How did you get interested in winemaking? Well, I went to New Zealand after my uh, army service uh, for my big trip and I was uh, hitchhiking in the middle of nowhere uh, when a vineyard owner picked me up. Uh, after a long ride together, uh, he offered me to stay with him and help him out in the field and I did. It was short, but it inspired me for the future. So you're saying just by chance, you're in the middle of New Zealand Definitely, and it just yeah. happens that a vineyard owner comes to pick you up and that is what inspired you yeah. to, to go into winemaking. True story. Amazing. So you came back to Israel and you did uh, your first I, I degree in I came back to Israel, I did my bachelor's in uh, biochemistry and food science, went to work in a winery in the Golan uh, Heights. Wow. And uh, then I uh, straight uh, headed to France to do my master's in viticulture and enology. And then you came back to Israel to do your PhD? Yes, this was the plan, to learn my, uh, the knowledge there and implement it here in Israel. So Noam, I know that um, you've been doing a lot of research in your PhD. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing? Yeah, well, uh, it's not a secret that warm climate viticulture is associated with uh, inferior wines. But we can't change the climate, so what we, what we can change is maybe the fruit microclimate. And this we can do by mainly uh, regulating the amount of uh, sunlight penetrating the fruit. So what you're talking about is the actual climate around each individual berry. Yeah, exactly. The microclimate, the conditions that are sensed by each berry. Most of, uh, most of what we did is apply uh, shading nets and uh, see how it affects the, the grape composition and we have state-of-the-art uh, metabolic profiling techniques to really see uh, all the compounds that are in the grape that are involved in the quality of the wine. Uh, and now we are also collaborating with a local winery uh, working on a new trellis that will create this partial shading by the leaves and not by shading nets. So you're actually going to cause the plants to grow to shade their own berries? Exactly. Well, that's amazing. I believe that Israel can become a leader in the adaptation of viticulture to climate change. Noam, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. It's been uh, amazing to hear what you're doing. And I believe that you and Aaron are going to take us now to what I think is going to be one of my favourite parts of the day. So why don't you lead on? OK, let's go. Oh wow, Aaron, this is absolutely amazing. Nice what a surprise. Absolutely amazing. So, uh, what are we drinking? Well, it is a Merlot from a little aged from 2012 from uh, Carme of Dat, a local winery. Excellent, excellent. Aaron, what can be better than sitting in the middle of the Negev desert drinking wine from the Negev? Chaim! Cheers!
The central Arava region where we are headed comprises 6% of Israel's land, yet it contains only about 0.04% of Israel's population, 3,500 people who were spread out among five Moshevim and two community settlements that were founded from the 1960s onwards. Most of the residents make their living from agriculture, and thanks to their creativity and daring, combined with scientific research, the farmers of the Arava have succeeded under conditions that may have deterred many others. We're just about to go and meet Mayan and Ariel Kitron, who farm right here in Moshav Edan. But where is here exactly? Well, I'm standing right next to the Jordanian border. If you look behind me, we can see no man's land. And if I just walk a few more meters, I can walk right into Jordan. There's no border fence here, no border markings, and I'm under the watchful eye of a Jordanian border post. And it really makes me think of the original pioneers who'd set up these communities right by what was then an enemy border. So uh, Mayan and Ariel, tell me uh, how this all started. How did you come to be in the Arava uh, and growing peppers? 18 years ago, Ariel uh, and I were already married and he told me that he wants to be a farmer. Uh, we both come from Kibbutzim in the northern part of Israel and uh, the place that we could start our own farm was here in the Arava. It was still uh, supported by the government and uh, this is why we ended up here in the Arava. What is it that drew you to the Arava? We like the desert. Yeah? Yeah. We can grow summer crops during the winter time with low energy demand. This is the advantage that we have here. Uh, and what is it you love about doing agriculture? I don't know. I, I feel the, 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 the land. I feel the, the crops. It's, uh, I like to, to see it uh, coming up and everything is successful. And I had to pick, actually. I, I had to harvest. <laughs> <laughs> so what market are you growing the peppers for? We're exporting mainly uh, to Europe, England and Russia. These are our markets overseas. And uh, the local market here in Israel. I would like you to try one of our peppers. Oh, I would very much like to do that, yes. Wow, look at that pepper. That's a beautiful pepper. Mmm. Just delicious. So should we go and see the tomatoes? Let's go to see the Let's tomatoes. Go. In the Negev desert, we have several abiotic stresses, such as high temperature in the summer, low temperature in the, in the winter, and also the irrigation water that we have here is mostly saline water. So since we are in a research and development center and we are working together with the farmers, we can uh, produce even more yield than other places uh, with drip irrigation, with the net house, with the trellising system and with other technologies that uh, uh, all together, when you put them all together, you produce the best yield, the best quality and the best taste. Okay, Simon, so we brought you here to see something very little and very special. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the tomberry tomato, which is the tiniest tomato. Wow, that's really small. Yeah, it is. Look at that. Wow, that really, really is small, isn't it? So what would you use this for? You just put it in the salad, you don't need to cut. It's very easy, it's very fresh. Wow, so this is going to go like to chefs and as well in uh, restaurants oh, and... Also, uh, also, yeah? also for the regular cups, uh, customers. Uh -huh. And is anybody else growing this? No, we, are the, we have the... the, the exclusive land. rights? It's exclusive rights, exactly. In Israel. In Israel. In Israel. And uh, are there only one type of variety or do you have like there's different colors? There's two colors. There's the red one and there's also the yellow one. By the way, the yellow one is tastier. Really? Yeah. So, so I'm you could try the red one and then try a yellow one. I'm gonna, well, I'm going to try this now. Mmm. They're really sweet. <laughs> they're really good. I recommend to try the yellow one. The yellow ones? They're better. Okay. I think so. Oh, we have some yellow ones here. Yeah. Wow. There you go. So I'm going to taste this one. Oh, that is good. That is really good. So when did you, what gave you the idea of bringing these uh, to, to Israel? I travel in a few places in the world to, to, to look for something else to grow in the, for the Israeli markets. And uh, one day I was in uh, Netherlands, I met uh, 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 
Deutsch guy that uh, he go he d he developed the tombury. And so it's called a tombury. Yeah. Okay, that's a cute name. Yeah. So this is just one of your tomato crops, right? Because I yeah. see uh, around that there's quite a lot of other tomatoes as well. So this is the this is just something that's beginning. Yeah, yeah. It's the first year. It's only on a small scale to check the market, to fill the market, and. In this greenhouse, we have unique and different types of right. uh, tomatoes that we can uh, check the reaction in the local market for them. So, Ariana Mayam, what is it about uh, life in the Aravad that you love so much? Uh, do you have a family that you've raised here? Yeah, we do have. We have three kids. Uh, the life here is very simple. They, they don't have a lot of places to go and hang around with the kids, uh, with the friends. It's more of going out to the desert and Enjoy the and enjoying life. themselves. Yeah. What type of person do you think is really attracted to here? Is it somebody who's looking for quality of life? Is it Zionism? Is it um, settling the Negev? Things? I think it's basically a combination of all what you mentioned. Uh, and very unique people come here to live in the Ava. But I have to say that uh, many of the kids that grew here in the Ava are coming back and building their they houses want to come back. Yeah. here in the Ava. Ariel and Mayan, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. I know you have a very busy day, um, and thank you so much for uh, showing us around the farm. It was our pleasure. It was great. Pleasure. Hey, Asaf. Hey, Simon. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having us here. Great. And I can't wait to see what you've got to show us. Well, come on in. Let's go. Wow. Asaf, this is astonishing. You're growing corals in the middle of the desert. Uh, I'm farming corals because I'm in a farm region, agriculture region. And corals, as you know, are symbiotic. Uh, with uh, algae that does photosynthesis. And this is what I usually have uh, during the year is, uh, is sunlight, and that's why I try to grow corals. How many types of corals do you grow? Uh, imagine around 50 different species. And they, are they from all over the world? Or? They come from the Far East, uh, most of them, some from Kenya, some from Australia even. So I have to ask you the million dollar question. What are you growing the corals for? Mainly, the market, my market, is the, the biomedical uh, companies, um, bone grafting. These are skeleton corals, very similar to our skeleton. How does that actually work? They use the coral as a, a, a glue or a scaffold, meaning that the body can actually seize it as its own and will replace it. So this is uh, one of the products that are coming from uh, uh, the corals. This product here is uh, for redoing bone grafting after a tooth is pulled out for its uh, dental market. What are the fish for? They're part of the holistic size of the, the system. They uh, add nutrients a little bit. They take uh, some of the allergies out. Uh, they, they move the, the water different directions. Well, Saf, I can see uh, there's some special type of uh, lighting here. What, what is uh, that lighting? Well, that lighting is sunlight. This is what we have here in the desert mostly. And the, the cores are obviously photosynthetic. Most of the energy they, that they need comes from the sun. And that uh, tubes will reflect the sunlight from outside. And, and mind you again, the, the, the lighting regime that I need is a 12 hours daylight and 12 hours of night. Yeah, so just to pay less electricity or no electricity, I have those uh, solar tubes. I understand you've also got um, some solar power as well, which you use. Yes, I uh, have some solar panels, quite a lot of them. So during the day, a lot of the uh, energy that I use here actually come from uh, energy that I produce. So we can actually say that I can think that there's three ways, in fact, you're very environmentally friendly. One, that you're using the solar tubes. Two, that you're using solar power. And three, you're not going into the ocean and cutting right. away uh, and destroying all the corals. You're actually growing them here. I, I am, that's right, yeah. So Asaf, how did you think about this absolutely crazy idea of growing corals in the middle of the desert? Well, I've been doing it for 10 years. I, I, I still think it's a crazy idea. This is uh, where I was born and raised. I've been uh, away for uh, 
sometimes came back as a lighting designer and I thought of how to take what I know into the region that which is all farming, agriculture. So I started looking into different things of uh, implementing LEDs into the farming. This and this and that made me think of this idea. I thought if I can grow it, I'll be the only one, lucky me. Uh, that's farming with uh, potential. And are you the only one who does this? To my knowledge, the way I do it, yes. Well, that was unbelievable. Corals in the desert. Who knew? We're heading to our final stop now on Moshav Chatseva, and we're going to meet Ran Epstein, who owns one of the most successful ornamental fish farms in Israel. So fish in the deserts, Ran, what's that all about? It's swimming uh, upstream, but there is only one advantage. We are far away from any natural habitat like river, lake or sea. And the isolation from a native or natural uh, pathogen is a very big advantage. Right. So actually we are very uh, famous for our disease free and for our biosecurity, unlike farms that close to so natural to uh, fish habitat. Right. How did this all start? You said to me you were from Tel Aviv. I'm from Ramat Gan, and this is my hobby since I was a child. I came down to the Arava because that time there was a huge support and the help, and that's how I built amazing farm, one of the most uh, successful farm worldwide. worldwide. Ram, this is an absolutely incredible operation you've got here. Um, so what type of fish are you growing? Actually, we grow uh, ornamental fish and uh, we grow uh, freshwater prawns, Malaysian prawns. The, the prawns we export to Far East, mm -hmm. China, Vietnam, Malaysia. The ornamental we produce mainly for the Western countries like uh, West Europe, uh, North America, South Africa. But in general, we sell all over the world. How much fish are you producing a year? I mean, you're, it's a huge uh, place, this. We produce uh, millions of fish per month. We are one of the biggest farms in the world for ornamental. Is much of the technology here a technology that you've developed yourself? And what was that that we saw coming uh, across? So we use uh, feeders, robot feeders that we developed by ourselves with Kibbutz Samar that uh, feed our uh, greenhouse constantly during the day, about 20 times per day, automatically. It helps us to feed uh, with very low cost. As far as water is concerned, you know, when somebody thinks about doing things in the desert, they're not necessarily going to think of growing fish, which is using water. So your water use is compared to others. What is, what is that like? We cycled 100% of the water. Mm -hmm. First of all, the, all our uh, fish farm is a biosecure system that they consume only 5 to 10% water change per day and the, the water that go out from our system. We irrigate all year round the water through a date uh, farm. We have a very good relation with all the university in Israel, especially with the Ben Gurion University. We have a very interesting collaboration with the Professor uh, Dina Zilberg. And also we have an amazing project collaboration with the Professor Amir Sagi. In this lab, we focus on uh, research related to fish health. We carry out research on various uh, disease-causing agents, parasites, bacteria. We are also looking at fish immunology, studying the fish immune system. We provide diagnostic services to uh, aquaculture farms around the country. And one of our main themes is uh, looking for natural alternatives for uh, chemicals and antibiotics that are used in aquaculture. We are looking for various plants and extracts of plants that can replace those uh, chemicals. We are also looking for natural treatments that can immunostimulate the fish, boost their immune system. We are using a lot of uh, algae in the food for that. That's one of the main ways by which we stimulate the fish, looking for unique microalgae that can be added to the food and, and make the fish stronger. 
I was fascinated to see that Ran is also growing millions of male prawns, and I was even more intrigued to see his workers injecting tiny prawn fry, and to learn that they were injecting them with an agent to silence a gene producing a hormone for male organs. Therefore, the injected male prawns develop female reproductive organs and can mate with regular male prawns to produce an all-male population, which are much larger than the females. So we went to see the Ben-Gurion University scientists who invented this technology to find out more about it. We uh, discovered a uh, insulin-like hormone that is responsible for maleness. We understood that if we silence the gene that is encoding this hormone, and this is exactly what we do, and now Ryan is doing it, in order to produce the broodstock that at the end is producing only males. And then you increase the yield when we realized that could be a game changer in the industry. Uh, because we, we are talking about a uh, huge market of, uh, in this s specific prawn, about 400,000 tons, and mostly in China and Vietnam. Uh, the Chinese market is the largest in the world, and uh, we are talking here uh, about uh, traditional food. It's not uh, an item that you eat in the restaurant once a year. It, this is their natural food, so uh, it is a very significant um, part of their diet. Since the animals are all male and non-breeding, we could use them for biocontrol tasks, uh, mostly in Africa, and this is a very large project that we are running. We are also working on a project together of sending those all-male prawns to Senegal in West Africa in order to fight a devastating disease. The disease is called Bilharzia, schistosomiasis. This disease is transmitted by freshwater snails. About 200,000 people die annually from the disease, and more than 200 million people are infected, mostly in Africa and our prawns were found to be voracious predators of those freshwater snails. So we, are, we want to use those prawns as biocontrol agents to eliminate the disease. It's a really big project financed by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and of course we are working with a local NGO in Senegal and the Senegalese Health Ministry and a few other universities from around the world and hopefully we'll have very good results soon enough. We've come to the end of our journey. We've seen jojoba plantations, exotic mushrooms on the Egyptian border. We've been to vineyards and drunk Negev wine in the middle of the desert. We've seen the smallest tombari tomato being grown by the Jordanian border. And we've seen corals being grown for medicine, ornamental fish, and we've seen biotech prawns. And when I think about it, to be a great farmer, you have to be so many things. You have to be a grower, of course, but you also have to be a scientist, an engineer, a business person, an economist, and above all, you have to be willing to take risks. We've also seen how interwoven the Negev farmers are with agricultural research. And we've met some of the brilliant scientists at Ben-Gurion University who are pushing forward the boundaries of the possible to support agriculture in the Negev. At the beginning of this movie, I ask the question whether we can still find that spirit of innovation that David Ben-Gurion envisioned in the Negev. I think David Ben-Gurion would have been really proud to see these amazing people farming the Negev, building Israel, and I think he would have been so gratified that Ben-Gurion University is at the forefront fulfilling his dream and working hand in hand with these desert pioneers.